afternoon and welcome. I'm Chris Principe, publisher of Financial IT, and I'm here at the huge Money 2020 show. This year, the show is in Las Vegas. And I know all of you heard a lot about Las Vegas. And I'm pleased to be here with one of the really historic companies. They've been a leader since, since I can remember, IBM. John, how are you today? I'm fantastic, Chris. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, my role is the global industry leader for financial services in IBM technology, and I'm also IBM distinguished engineer. I'm delighted to meet you. Well, John, you know, IBM has such a history and such a range of products and services. Where is your focus these days? Well, that's a great question. We have been working with clients for some time to make certain that they understand who we are today. We have that long storied reputation of being a stalwart of technology. Okay. And oftentimes people don't understand how the company has pivoted. So Arvind, when he took over as CEO now a few years ago, was very, very intentional about setting the vision, strategic, uh, strategic direction and execution for IBM. Of course, all the things that we hold dear about serving our clients and serving their outcomes hold true. And we are very intentional and specific about doing that with a very tight focus on what it means to be a hybrid cloud technology provider and an AI technology provider. We see the two as intrinsically linked. And so everything that we do across technology, our consulting and our ecosystem organizations and our infrastructure organization, infrastructure and software is, is uh, grounded in that mission. We see that mission as being very fundamental to what our clients, IBM's clients are enterprise clients, many of which are highly regulated. And so being grounded in the hybrid cloud and AI mission is central to how they're building and how they're consuming and using technology, uh, both as we go forward and far into the future. Uh, and that um, is a fundamental point. Uh, and hybrid has never been more important given all of the experience that firms now have with the public cloud, Chris, and how that has played out and how it hasn't. Hybrid is on a map at almost every major financial services firm, and there isn't one that isn't interested or doing something about AI. So we're in the very sweet spot. Well, uh, sweet spot indeed, John, because IBM, of course, with, with the, the storied history, you already have clients that are the biggest and the best, and they have you know long histories with working with you. Oh, yes. So the, the challenge of being able to continue that and constantly be innovative and bring them something new is, is uh, must be a real everyday challenge for you. Uh, it's one that we live and breathe and thrive on. A, a great example is, our, is a client, uh, and we have many clients using the mainframe platform mm -hmm. as their core system right. and core transaction processing system. There are, there, there are many in the world who think that's very old and uh, no longer useful. And yet, for financial services firms, uh, for almost 90% of the large ones, the IBM mainframe is the bedrock of how they do their accounting and payments business and core banking processing and securities processing. And so how we help them with that, uh, what some would say is old technology, I would never call it old technology, but I would say many of the systems that our clients have were written 40 years ago by other firms or by our clients. So helping them make new use of that technology, helping them make you new use of the software and continuing to invest in a platform that gives them enormous stability and resilience, enormous security and availability, which I can't think of a bank that doesn't need those things. And of course, helping banks connect to an ecosystem of fintechs through hybrid technologies, high APIs, microservices, uh, all of which are packaged and consumed on hybrid cloud deployment models, both on the mainframe and in public cloud and in uh, our clients' own data centers and taking advantage of 
AI enablers and accelerators, that's what keeps that platform incredibly vibrant uh, for our clients. And they want us to continue investing in that technology. Well, John, I, I certainly imagine that you know a lot of these big banks have huge investments over the years in these systems. You know, the, the, often we hear about legacy and how it's very difficult for the for the banks to change. So much of their budget is taken up in being able to maintain these old systems. So IBM, who's been the bedrock for them, now comes and is able to offer them a path forward to be able to benefit from some of the new technologies. Mm -hmm. It's it's revolutionary to me. And that's something that we have been uh, working on with our clients for a long time. This started before AI, Chris. So before AI, we were thinking about and, and delivering capabilities that would enable our clients to open their current core systems with API calls from new code into the existing systems. We were finding ways to do data synchronization between databases running on the mainframe and data warehouses running in cloud technology. We were looking at ways to create extension architectures that enabled an existing core system to use event-driven architectures and newer technology approaches to interact directly with code written uh, running side by side the core system. Then AI comes along and in our case, we've invested hugely in building uh, the granite models and a set of assistants uh, that help humans perform key parts of their business process. And one of the humans here, the, one of the most important knowledge workers in any bank's a software developer. The Watson Code Assistant that we built for working with uh, COBOL uh, and other programming languages is essential. And in some cases is creating new productivity of up to 60% from an existing developer. How are we doing that? The technology that we created in the Code Assistant helps a developer understand COBOL that they've never seen before. So it provides a, a, a natural language description of what that code is understood to do. And then helps a developer target modernization approaches for example, an interception point within a huge body of COBOL directly there to say, I want to use a function right there in a completely new way. To the point where we can also now accurately translate that existing COBOL into a new generation programming language like Java. Now, that has been something that people have been doing or trying to do for a very long time. But there's a, a, a kind of a joke among software developers in the industry that what you get from the old fashioned processes is something called Jobol, Java that looks like COBOL, a literal translation. The secret about Jobol is that it's harder to work with than COBOL. We don't want to make Jobol with our code assistant. We want to make perfectly formed Java hier class hierarchies and methods um, and interface points. Uh, that is based upon understanding what the code needs to do. And we've been very successful in working with clients on that. And that's an area where I think we see huge excitement. The other benefit of, of that, Chris, is that in building the models that we built, the Granite models, and one of the Granite models that IBM created, open source model, is for programming. And the difference between using a standard large language model from one of the big companies. Um, the difference is that the accuracy of tra Java translation from the regular large language models may be in the 30 to 40% range. We're in the high 96, 7% accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so we're super proud of that. Now, part of this is because we've been investing in generative AI and from a research perspective for many, many years. Uh, and because we had that research uh, um, heritage and asset, or the, the, the benefit of the research, we were able to productize incredibly quickly. Um, when generative AI burst on the scene, we were ready to go with enterprise-grade product. Um, so enterprise clients are who we serve, and that's, that's why it matters for us and for our clients. Well, you know, John, I mean, I, I grew up in technology, you know, with COBOL as, as the, 
the mission critical language. Absolutely, me and, too. Yeah, and it still is. I mean, there's no no question about that. Uh, although you know, you, you hear now, you know, nobody wants to learn that in school. No, I know. Right. I know. Okay, so so you, the challenge you have is is pretty great, and you really have been able to meet that in kind of an extraordinary way. Well, I think it's crucially important because the last thing anyone. Uh, needs or wants is a perception of being part of the past. So when we think about programming, that's one aspect. When we think about operating the mainframe, if we didn't innovate the, the operational capabilities of the mainframe, arguably no one would know how to do it anymore because they'd retired. So we've built natural language interfaces around the mainframe. You'll see those come to life uh, in the coming months uh, as we release new capabilities. But there will be a conversational interface that enables us to, to, to start to direct the operation of the mainframe in very new ways that someone who doesn't have the 30, 40 years of knowledge, institutional and corporate and technology knowledge can start to approach uh, the technology of the mainframe in a way that is easy to understand and ready to use. Now, the way that we've been able to do that is because we've packaged that institutional knowledge into AI models. Um, and so that represents the best of learning, the best of experience, and enables a mainframe to be used in, a, in an incredibly contemporary way. Uh, and so I'm proud of what we're doing in that space. And I think our clients, our clients are enormously invested in technology vitality and technology currency and skills vitality and currency. And so I think this is going to be tremendously exciting for our clients. Well, you know, when you look at, at some of your clients, banks primarily as, as one key sector that, that you guys have done a, a really excellent mm -hmm. job, you know, they're not about money in the vault anymore. No. You know, it, they're, they're really kind of big software companies. Indeed. And, and data is their new gold. Oh, yes. I agree. And, but the challenge is it's, it's siloed in many cases, accessibility, and then even if you have accessibility, what do you do with it? Yep, I agree. You must be reading my mind. Yes. <laughs> I, I've, written, I've written very extensively about this, Chris, because uh, at IBM, uh, we started a, a, a sort of movement uh, and a thought, uh, a, a way of thinking about this called the AI ladder. And we've iterated the AI ladder, but there was a very fundamental concept that underpinned the AI ladder. And it was that there is no AI without IA, information architecture. There's no artificial intelligence without in, uh, information architecture. And um, over time, with the benefit of experience in doing this, we, we absolutely validated that idea. It speaks to this idea that in so many companies, uh, and it's especially in financial services, financial services for whatever reason have especially had this challenge. They are absolutely full of information. Uh, and for all sorts of reasons over the years, whether it's technical reasons, technical silos, or political silos, you know, I, my data is my data, and I will not share it with you. That's a perfect example of a political silo. Whereas in reality, my data is the company's data, and I should use it for the company's purpose and benefit. And so technology certainly has played a huge role in all of this, because uh, the kind of technology that we've created in data fabric technology and data uh, lake house technology enables our clients to connect to their data wherever it sits inside a hybrid architecture. That hybrid architecture spans public cloud, private cloud, on-prem data centers, managed service, software as a service providers, a truly hybrid approach to saying, I know the data sits everywhere. I want to connect to it. I want to understand what it is. Um, and if I can understand it, I can use it multiple ways. The most important way for most, as a starting point for most firms is for, for governance. Uh, being able to say, I, ha I know where my data sits. I know what it is. I know the structure. I know the meaning of that data. However, taking a governance only view means that you're not using that data creatively in new ways. You're not creating, uh, you're not in enabling a culture 
of citizen data scientists inside an organization with self-service access on a permission secure basis to date and with privacy controls to data wherever it sits. And so being able to make that available, being able to create data sources, data products from an existing governance catalog is a huge capability that our clients need to unlock the value of AI. Because if data it sits in silos, I don't really know how we're training models very well. Uh, and so it's the, the data, uh, access to data, and being able to use data wherever it sits is a huge step one on the AI journey, huge. You know, for me, John, I've always admired the research capabilities that IBM has had. And in my view, that research capability has allowed them not only to be at the forefront of new technologies, but even create some. Oh yeah. But to me, more importantly, is you then don't, don't go forward with any and every technology. IBM has had the knack of being able to find the technology that benefits the business. So now with generative AI, how, how do you think you can benefit the business? Well, we're very, we have a very intentional approach on this. I love the question, Chris. If I think about, I've been in IBM for a number of years. I won't say how many because I'm still 27 as far as anyone's <laughs> concerned. Um, but <laughs> I've been in IBM for a while. And the most one of the most important changes I've seen is about clock speed. Uh, and IBM Research is a fabulous example of where the clock speed has changed. Uh, it could take years to go from research asset to product in the IBM of old. Now we can do that in months. And part of being able to do that enables us to, one, validate technology and scale technology approaches. The biggest challenge that most of our clients are having in the AI space is that Everyone's been experimenting. Very few firms have been achieving what I would describe as meaningful KPI value. And secondly, many firms have not been able to scale their AI initiatives. Uh, and you know, last and um, probably most important, if you're a regulator is the, and a regulated entity, is the ability to trust AI. Now you asked the question about use cases and how AI is being used. We think that AI needs to be used for things that matter. And while there are fun uh, consumer-based use cases, and we all love them, and we all have fun with them, the reality is that they don't necessarily help regulated enterprises do their business. So we've been relentlessly focused on three use cases. Customer experience, because we think that customer experience is, is, and can, is has been, and will continue to be for many years one of the foundation points of where most firms are trying to create frictionless, meaningful, enjoyable contextual customer experiences. There's so much wrapped up in doing that, that it's more than hyper-personalization. We think that there's an enormous focus on employee productivity, and we're seeing digital labor, approaches to digital labor uh, with assistants that help uh, employees and the workforce and then agents that take on more of the work come to life. And then I spoke already about the third use case, which is software development, where we see productivity scaling uh, for de software developers and um, administrators. We see the um, uh, productivity improvements of something like 60%. So. We've been very intentional in saying there's a class, of, there's three classes of use cases that, that we are focused on and, and that we see our clients being focused on those. Customer experience, employee productivity with digital labor and application development and IT ops. And yes, there will be thousands of other use cases, but that, that those three classes are where our clients are moving. And so we see some incredible success stories uh, we just uh, produced a video with NatWest in the UK talking about their use of Watson X and how it's uh, changing customer experiences and customer journeys and creating a much more personalized, enjoyable customer journey. And so uh, um, 
that is a success story about which we are incredibly proud and about which uh, NatWest is incredibly proud of their ability to innovate and scale AI. In employee productivity with digital labor, IBM has an exciting story to share. What, we did something very interesting in this space, Chris, and it came from the very top of our company. So Arvind Krishna, our CEO, declared that we would generate $3 billion of new productivity inside IBM by adopting generative AI and automation. He did that, I think it was two years ago, um, and he's just increased the target to five because we've already got the three billion. Now, bear in mind, we're a company of 250,000 employees approximately. That number's always changing a little bit. Uh, but 250,000, not small. So having that as a test bed for the world for enterprise AI is actually quite significant because it means that we are, we are client zero for our technology. What does it mean to be client zero? We can understand the technology itself, but we can also understand how to deploy it and make it real. And so I think about up to 20 business processes inside IBM now running on AI-based assistance, our HR processes, our legal processes, our supply chain processes, our customer service, our employee help desk for technology. Um, the biggest one of all that um, I think uh, we are absolutely uh, enjoying as IBM employees is our HR service center, which has become a service called Ask HR. Um, Ask HR, we were all very concerned. I had somebody that I used to pick up the call, pick up the phone and have white glove HR service. When I thought that was going away, I was devastated because I thought, who's going to do this stuff for me? Well, guess what? Ask HR is doing everything that I need. It's doing it more simply. It's doing it faster. Uh, and, you know, this is something that we could show sometime because there's nothing like seeing this come to life. Sure. There's nothing like seeing this working. Um, but when I see it working, you know, I start to understand, actually, that what I have today is better than the white glove service I had uh, and because it's faster and easier to use and I can do things immediately that I need to do. And so the NPS for that, mm -hmm. and that is something that is rolled out across all of our employees, the NPS went through the roof. Um, and so this is about saying that we have great technology and now great learnings for how to deploy it at scale to achieve outcomes, meaningful productivity outcomes. I can't think of many companies, especially financial services firms, where the CEO, CEO, CFO, CIO, COO aren't relentlessly focused on efficiency and productivity because it funds their ability to innovate product and innovate client experience across every segment of financial services. And it also funds their ability to work with a very rich and diverse and hugely innovative fintech ecosystem, which is why we're here, right? Um, uh, and so creating that ability to redirect investment away from old operational styles and techniques is a huge financial lever that any CFO, COO will want to use. Well, you know, John, as a fellow 27 year old, here at Money 2020, I walk down the aisles, I feel like a kid on Christmas day. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Why has IBM chosen to be at Money 2020? Because our clients are here, our partners are here, uh, and our future clients and partners are here. We want people to get to know us, right? We are known for who we are and what we've done in the past. We are also going to be known for who we are in the future and what we're going to do. And our journey of, of reinventing ourselves is, is one that we're proud of, but one that is highly relevant for so many financial services firms that are also on their reinvention journey. And we fundamentally believe that our reinvention journey towards hybrid cloud and AI is part of what powers new generation, even old new generation companies <laughs> into their future. Because 
it's very clear that if you have a technology estate that is aging, you need ways to make that work in new ways. And that's exactly what we're about to deliver value. So we're, we are where our clients are. A huge part of who we are is our ecosystem and fintechs and the whole range of technology partners are part of IBM's ecosystem and we want them to be and we want them to see our technology like what's next, the mainframe, whatever it might be as having synergistic value and helping them deliver their products and capabilities faster, safer, more resiliently. So John, just to talk about the future, I want to come back to something that you said a little earlier and it, it has to center around AI and the difference in this new technology versus a lot of the other ones that we've seen in the past, you know, this technology can really can start at home yes. and can produce uh, changes and benefits and improvements that allow you to have uh, huge savings as IBM has had internally. Then you have uh, a showcase and technology that you can productize to your customers who then can roll it out to their end users. Yes. Much different than a lot of the other technologies we've seen. Absolutely. So, how far in the future, how far can this really go? Uh, we are just at the beginning of the journey, as is, as is everyone, Chris. Mm -hmm. I think the crucial part of what you just said is that we, we are battle testing not only the technology, but the approach. And I think our clients expect nothing less than that because there's a whole lot of new technology being created right now doesn't matter whether it's been created in tiny teams or giant teams with small budget or large budget, that technology is being unleashed on the world. And in many respects, firms don't know whether or how they can trust it. And so another element that I think I really should bring into uh, an innovation story is how do I create trust? Now, this will be crucial because regulators, even if banks or other firms don't want it, regulation will emerge quickly in this space. In Europe, that's already happened uh, to a small degree with the EU AI Act. And, and I say small degree because that's just a starting point for what legislation and regulation can become. But it's a good starting point. Uh, when I think about this, I think that trust is going to be a, a massive issue. If I'm buying AI technology and I'm unleashing it on my customers, how do I know that it will behave? How do I know that it won't start swearing or using profanity? How do I know that the answers that it provides are good answers? That reflect my brand, reflect my products, reflect reflect my accurate business processes. And there are already many examples of where other firms have had issues of showing that live up to expectation. We approach this space slightly differently. The question I encourage all our clients to ask is of their generative AI companies. I, I ask the question, how did you create the model? And the way to discern, if I may be so bold, um, the quality of that answer is to see if you get one. The reason I say that is because many of the large AI companies simply will not disclose uh, how they build their models. They refuse to disclose how they build their models. If I'm a buyer of AI, I'm gonna, if someone won't tell me basic stuff like that, I'm gonna run. IBM's approach to building models, like the granite models that we've created, uh, is that we are completely transparent about the data sources that we used. We have something called the blue pile, which is a massive data repository. Step one was understanding what's in there. Step two was understanding what to take out. And why would you take things out of a training data set? Maybe because there's hate abuse and profanity in there. Maybe because there's proprietary data in there that cannot be shared. Maybe because there's licensed data in there. That is someone else's licensed data. Or maybe because the data represented is just not correct. Right, so step one of making the blue pile 
something that we can use to train granite models is not adding data, it's taking data out and be very clear about what we took out and what remains. Step two, so in building those models, we are then very, very clear about how we've done that. The other aspect of creating trust is the ability to measure model performance over time. And so when a client is looking at answers generated by their small or large language model, there are quantitative measures that can be used to determine or to describe the quality of a generated answer, such as the risk of hate, abuse, profanity, incorrectness, quality of sentence construction, and, and so on, and the ability to link back to a data source in a model that was used to generate an answer. So that, that aspect of model creation and model performance is a crucial part of the governance capability that we've built into what's an governance. We've taken the view in financial services, the standard approach to governance, risk and, and compliance is to use a GRC platform or tool like a, IBM's Open Pages. And the philosophical approach as it relates to AI, and not just philosophical, now real, is that you can look at AI governance as an, not a separate business process, but as an integral part of GRC processes that already run in every regulated firm today. So that's how we've approached it. There's one last important point on governance that I want to raise, Chris, and that's as it relates to proprietary data, internal data. If you think about the large language models that we're all familiar with, they have probably ingested, hoovered up 97, 95% of the world's published data already, published data. What they don't include is corporate data that is proprietary or private. The opportunity here for firms is to leverage open models and train them with their internal proprietary data, which makes a model for our client specific to them. And so what we've done in that space, working with Red Hat, company we acquired, who majors in open technologies, is build Instruct Lab. Instruct Lab is a model development technology approach that enables our clients to extend large language models or small language models with their proprietary data. This will be a huge innovation for our clients. And they can do all of that, Chris, with the trust aspects that we mentioned of what is the lineage and the creation process of my proprietary model that now contains my proprietary data. The nature of that model is it stays entirely safe within a very specific zone of a cloud service or even on-prem, even on my mainframe uh, in the most secure environment I can have. Um, and then I can measure the performance of that, trust the way it was created and measure the way it performs over time. So the frontier here comes from our clients building highly proprietary one-off models that reflect their institution's corporate knowledge, extending a model that already has a base domain knowledge around some aspect of financial services terminology or programming language or legal terminology, whatever it might be. That is tremendously exciting. Well, John, I mean, Everything you've spoken about, you know, the future is really bright at IBM. Oh, yes. As a trusted admirer for decades, you know, the hearing about revitalizing the mainframe, the hybrid cloud, and generative AI, and the, the, the extent that IBM is willing to take it, you know, we just, just have to be trusting of IBM because you guys have proven that over and over in the future. And I learned when I was young the, the benefits of working with IBM for your career. So with that, I'd like to say it's been a real pleasure, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so really much. Really enjoyed it. Financial IT, Chris Principe at Money 2020.